Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Welcome to this week's episode of the Flower Lounge. I'm so excited for this week's topic. I'm going to be interviewing the veterinarian of my dogs, and we're going to talk about all things holistic health and pets. So I am like beyond excited for this conversation with my holistic veterinarian, Peggy Lacombe. And just to tell you a little bit about her background, she went to veterinary medicine school in Colorado State University. And she had a practice in both Washington, the state of Washington, and in Arizona, right? Well, I was an associate, so I didn't own the practice. Oh, yeah. well, you did veterinary yeah, medicine. Did. Okay. You did the veterinary <laughs> medicine for, for a long time, for like since 1993. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's a long time. And then a few years ago, she got certified in veterinary acupuncture and she specializes in herbal herbalism, food therapy, advanced acupuncture, and tween off her pets. And she learned all of this at the Chi Institute in Florida. She's currently owner of our partner at, um, at your bark and call veterinary house calls. So great. She does house calls. Um, and, uh, Oh, I see. So, and you've been the the main owner of that for the last six years. Mm -hmm. So not only do we have the most amazing holistic veterinarian here, we also have woman in business. We can talk about so many things. And she has three cats and a little monster dog, as she calls it. (laughs) (laughs) But we'll get into that later. Um, First, we do this exercise where you close your eyes and go back to a time in your childhood when you played around flowers or plants or trees and just think about what you were doing at the time, who you were with, what you were up to and see if you can locate a favorite flower or botanical. And once you've got that figured out in your mind, see if you can figure out how you would describe the personality of that flower or botanical or its qualities And then whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes and tell us about what you're thinking of, where you were, what you're up to, your favorite, and the three words. Okay. So um, I grew up in New Hampshire and uh, Lily of the Valley grows there. I love that flower. And um, it's one of my mom's favorites. Um, I guess I would think um, peaceful. in the woods and I don't know it smells good it smells good and when you think about being in the woods how does that make you feel I love it I I need to be outdoors a lot what does it feel like when you're in the woods Uh, I just feel like I can breathe um Mm -hmm. the trees and you know it's just uh it just feels good um I'm calm Mm -hmm. you know i feel like I'm back in my body <laughs> in the woods and uh, I love to hike. And so, yeah, I just like being outside. Cause what we find is that the way you describe your childhood flower is typically how you bring your greatest gifts into the world. Oh, so you could describe your own personality as being peaceful, calm, um, helping people to, to breathe, to get back in their bodies or pets. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> so. What, what do we, I have to know the inside story of why you call your little dog a monster dog. Oh gosh. Well, <laughs> so I, we don't know what he is. We did the DNA test, you know, cause I was curious about what he is. He's got these funky little legs and this long body. Um, and he's just very muscular. So we did a DNA test and it came back as a Brittany Spaniel and, and something else that he definitely was not. Um, so but he looks like a Jack Russell in a lab mix. And he definitely has a Jack Russell personality, <laughs> very stubborn, likes to dig, likes to jump up and punch people. <laughs> um, he's very fear. He was, he was very fearful dog. He's, he's better now, but he, he, uh, but he sounds tough. Like he's see another dog and he growls. But if that dog were to come up and say hello to him, he'd be behind my legs. So he's just 
<laughs> he's he's very unpredictable around other dogs. He's fine with people, but he's just he's a crazy little dog. He's I'm used to having like goldens <laughs> or golden mixes, and <laughs> so he is a departure from that. And, <laughs> has made me learn some new ways to train, <laughs> have more patience <laughs> and let him be his doggy self. That's, that's what is a little bit hard for me. Cause he doesn't have any, he has no uh, boundaries. So he just like, will plow through. You're just a piece of furniture to him where my other dogs have always been very much like they know their space. He does not know that, <laughs> but he's, he's pretty cute. So, yes. I feel like we're getting the dirt here. <laughs> the veterinarian's pets. What's his name? Makai. Makai. And then you have three cats. Three cats, yes. Uh, Bonnie, Clyde, and Floyd. Oh, cute. So, the gangster group. But Bonnie <laughs> and Clyde were already named. They were abandoned at the pet clinic that I was using before and they were they were kittens. And then Floyd was uh some I think somebody just abandoned him and he ended up in my backyard and my husband's like there's a feral cat outside. And I said, how do you know it's feral? Well, it's out there. So I went out and I see him and he's this poor, skinny, starving thing. And he, I'm like, oh, poor kitty. And then he comes out from behind this piece of wood he was hiding behind. And he just was not a feral at all. He's, <laughs> he's rubbed up against, <laughs> against me, rubbing. And he, so he ended up in the house and he was our third cat. <laughs> So that's our menagerie. That's so great. Yeah, yeah. You, you know all my um, you know all my inside stories with with my three dogs. I, we have three dogs, and just for the listeners, I have three dogs. You may have seen the story of Joy because we published that um, pretty publicly in the Lotus Way blog. Joy is almost seventeen now, and she Peggy came into my life at such a critical point when I was. Joy is like, I mean, I love all three dogs, right? But Joy is sort of she's my first dog and really like my heart connection and she had had several strokes we were living in a different house and actually the the biggest um, sort of stroke episode came after taking her to the veterinarian's office and so I like quickly realized I can't like she's getting too old I can't take her to the vet anymore and I was so amazed and lucky to find Peggy because she does house calls and she could come to our house and see Joy and the rest of the gang and I don't know, um, if you don't know the Joy story, we went through uh, over two years of thinking that she was like right on the brink of death. I mean, there were times when we were like the whole family was circled around and she had the silk pillow and we were just about ready to send her off. And then she's a miracle dog. <laughs> and then my roommate started cooking something in the kitchen because we were kind of like at the send off for like an hour. And finally my roommate thought, well, maybe I'll make dinner. And then Joy woke up and was like, I think it's done for dinner. We'll just skip the dying part and make it to dinner. <clears throat> and there were even, and then the story that I told at a few flower lounge events where, where she, she had a few strokes and she couldn't walk at all. Do you remember that? Uh -huh. She was just like flat, flat out on the floor, yeah. couldn't walk. And then she did this amazing process where she like rewired her entire brain by having me walk her around the house and outside, I had like a little vest that I held her up on. And literally she'd like wake me up in the middle of the night and she'd just like, we need to pound the pavement. We need to go walking. So for like several days, it was almost like a week. I didn't get any sleep because we were just walking, walking, walking. And she would put herself into these really precarious positions and get stuck and then figure out how to get out of them. But when we finally took her off the the leash and she could do it. She'd just jam herself into a corner and then figure her way out. And so somehow through that process, she like rewired her whole brain. And now she, she like went back to a normal dog. And that. <laughs> Have you ever seen anything like that? No, <laughs> no, she's, she's amazing. I, I just, I can't believe that she's just still trucking. She's just, she's amazing. I mean, from her diagnosis of not having any, any, any platelets. I mean, she's like the lowest dog. I've seen a platelet count of, I don't know, I think she had 16 platelets or something on her blood work that we did initially. So, and that's like, you're bleeding out kind of platelets. Platelets help clot blood. And so she wasn't clotting and that that was just scary. And, uh, but she and you, you know, you guys are a big part of um, her healing too. Um, but yeah, she did. And she's a, she's a strong dog. She really is. She's just, 
Yeah. So. And she, she, she had internal bleeding. So typically yeah. in those cases, what the dogs will bleed out and yeah. die within a couple of weeks. Yeah. Or, or one week. Not even, you know, it can happen really quick, like a matter of hours or days even. So, oh my God. Yeah. <clears throat> we yeah. used things like Shepherd's Purse, Cayenne, um, and then this fabulous Chinese formula that mm-hmm. you gave us that mm-hmm. we've been using for years. Yeah. Yeah. And find, like pretty much got her to a point of total stabilization. What's the formula called again? Is it the um the dark one? The um, Glenia? Yes, yeah. Glenia. The Glenia and Remenia. Um, so that's the main one. For building blood. Mm-hmm. Yep. And blood tonics. And then you I think the food therapy was a big part of it too, because you gave her a lot of blood blood tonic foods, um, and that really helped her, helped support her as well. Um, but yeah, I think that those are mainstays. And I think, I think actually the food you, you guys cooking for her was, was like one of the biggest things that helped her. her. Yeah. <laughs> bone broth and yeah. black chicken bone broth and beef heart, beef heart, <laughs> beef heart every day. <laughs> and then Peggy would come with different recipes for cookies and like how to smash up the Chinese med- the herbs and like sneak them into little cookies mm-hmm. so that the dogs would eat them. <laughs> That's so great. Um, what other issues have we had that other people might have? Gracie, she's got the itching. Gracie's got the skin allergy. Yeah, she's got allergies. And allergies are, uh, um, I think that's the hardest, one of the hardest things to treat in any medical field because <laughs> it's difficult. And especially here, um, we have so many allergens that we've introduced to like all these plants that aren't native to the desert. And that's what everybody's reacting to mostly like grass you know, everybody plants grass in their yard and we shouldn't be because we're in the desert, but a lot of dogs are really allergic to, to that and they lay out in it. And so they get, they get really irritated, but then a lot of the trees that we plant, ornamental trees that aren't native, they're allergic to like olive trees are a big um, source of um, problems, but then native ones can be too. So a lot of dogs are allergic to sage and things like that. So, um, but a lot of dogs are also allergic to food or ingredients in food, like, um, but, uh, skin and then skin problems can arise from other internal problems. So like if they're blood deficient, um, in Chinese medicine, that doesn't mean they're necessarily anemic, but, um, they just don't have a good circulatory system to the skin. So for any listeners who have issues like that, what do you recommend? We have to kind of work on several fronts. So working with uh, changing their diet, which mostly I have people switch to either home cooked or raw formulation, depending on the, on the patient, most of the time home cooked. And uh, there's a lot of sources, you know, people can get recipes from books like Dr. Becker has a book out there. Um, there a lot of the veterinary schools have um, plate websites or doctors that you can consult to get homemade diets. So you have a well-balanced diet. That's, that's the biggest problem with cats and dogs. Make sure you get all the vitamins and minerals and that helps their immune system too. Uh, But diet is probably a big part of it. And um, supplements, you know, depending on what's going on, there's a lot of uh, things that you can do outside of the body too, to help cool down a hot spot. By, like there's essential oils. I uh, like Dr. Shelton. She's got Animalio and there's a lot of essential oils you can get from her that are animal safe. You have to be careful and make sure you use animal safe oils. And uh, she has blends of oils. So rarely does she use a single essential oil, but um, so things like that. So every, it, you know, most natural things that we can do is probably the best. A lot of times you'll take them in and first thing they'll want to throw at them is steroids and all these big gun medications. And sometimes, I mean, if they're, if they're really chewing it themselves and are really raw, then you have to do that short term, but then can switch over. So, okay. So let's just dial it back for, for any of the listeners who are, who have pets and maybe they're interested in transitioning from dry food into home. Let's just talk about that for a little, okay. like demystify, like what, I mean, I know I, I do, um, you know, we like we do cooked meats like turkey or mm-hmm. 
beef or chicken, rice, uh, veggies, like what's, what are some like tips and ways to make that easy? You know, we're all really busy. Right. So I guess the easiest thing to do is even if you can do like half home cooked and half kibble or even a quarter home cooked or something like that to mix in with the kibble, you'll be helping, especially your dog so much more by doing that. So vegetables are important. Um, and then, uh, it depends on what the dog is showing. So like for your dog, Gracie, she's older and she has kind of a combination of a deficiency um, problem and a damp problem, mm -hmm. but a young dog might have a, have an excess problem. And so they would need um, like very cold proteins, but she kind of needed a combination of warm and cold protein. So you need, you need someone who's trained to look for those things in the, in the, patient that you're seeing. So it kind of depends, but um, most of the time, any whole foods that you're cooking or you can cook up for your dog. So like sweet potatoes, spinach. Yeah. A lot of greens, especially for allergy dogs helps um, kind of cool them down a little bit. Chard. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and uh, broccoli, you know, you want to be careful with all the cruciferous vegetables, you know, you want to alternate those with like peas and beans and things like that, because those all can produce urinary crystals. So any dog that's prone to those like little schnauzers or, you know, some of the other dogs, not too much cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli. Correct. Okay. Yep. And kale and spinach. It's all those things can kind of contribute to that. So it's okay to do that. I usually just have people rotate. Like if you cook something up on the weekend, like a lot of times a lot of people just cook stuff up on the weekend, freeze batches so they can thaw out during the week. So you're not having to cook every day for your dog and make things easier. And you can crock pot cook too, you know, just have everything in a crock pot and mm, then portion smart. that out. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can do it. And there's, um, you know, there's recipes for good soups you can make. Congees work good for debilitated dogs and cats. Um, but yeah, just any, so if you're cooking dinner, say, and you're cooking up some broccoli for yourself, <laughs> just cook some up without any seasoning and stuff for your dog. And uh, yeah, you'd be amazed what they love. My, that's my dog's favorite vegetable, broccoli, out of all the stuff he eats. He, <laughs> he loves that. So um, but if they're not used to it, you do have to go kind of slow. You know, you don't want to mess up their GI system because they're not used to all the fiber of the vegetables. So just go slow and, um, you know, have, have find a holistic vet in your area. Um, and you can, it's easy to find one on the America HVMA website. They have a whole list of um, holistic vets that are on there and you can go by zip code and you can find someone. And I'll just say, we'll post all of these resources. So everything you're mentioning, the book, the recipes, anything, uh, the website to look for holistic vets, we'll post that on the blog post for the podcast. Um, we had, so we did something um, different this time with, with your interview that was really fun. And we posted up on Facebook and Instagram that we were going to be chatting with you. And we asked for questions from the listeners. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we can just go through some of those. Sure. Um, the first one comes from Gigi from Sikkim, Washington, and she asks, are there any acupressure points we can learn to do on our aging pets to ease pain? Yes. Um, there's actually, there's actually quite a few things you can do. Um, and here's another good reference you can get is, um, four paws, uh, yeah, four paws, five directions. I think that's by Dr. Cheryl Schwartz. Um, and I can give you that information okay. too. Okay. Um, and it's a really good um, uh, Chinese medicine book, but she has all, she has a lot of pictures in there on cats and dogs photographs actually. And she shows the meridians on there. Oh wow! And um, so she gives a lot of good advice just, and it's easy to understand. So you can, you can follow that at home and you can get that, you know, anywhere, but I, I still look at that book a lot too, but um, anyway, there's some, there's some major points that you can rub. Um, like there's a, a point on the shoulder for front leg pain. There's a point on the back hip that's for hind limb pain. And just if, you know, most dogs love to be massaged and cats like to be massaged. I find now 
as I'm doing more Twina, the massage cats really don't want me to needle them as much as they want the massage. Oh, and, interesting. And I'm actually getting pretty good results with doing massage therapy and kitties and uh, helping them, especially with mobility problems. I have a patient now who's, um, is she 18, I think, and she's uh, not on any Western meds, but she's got hyperthyroid disease and we're just treating her with herbs and I do massage on her about every six weeks or so. And uh, that cat was not really jumping up on stuff. And now she's <laughs> flying up on the countertops and running around through the house. So she's, really? she's doing really good. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, you know, I think if, uh, you know, that helps a lot. And a lot of times I'll show owners where to, where to do the massage that they need to do in between my, my visits. But, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. I remember you showed me some points that I was doing on joy for a while for kidneys Yeah, and you came by, uh, a while back and you did some like laser treatments mm -hmm. and she actually just her mobile, her mobility, like yeah. for, for like one day after that, she was like really going strong. Yeah. So laser is kind of like acupuncture and that, uh, it's kind of cumulative effect. So the more you do it, then the more benefit you'll have. And then you can so usually you have to do it kind of several times in a row to get a good response. And then you can kind of back off from there. And uh, it's, they just tell you what they need. They'll let you know when they're <laughs> kind of slowing down and they need a treatment a lot of uh -huh. times, especially for pain and things like that. But yeah, I have a, I have a cold laser and a, a lot of us do. And I think it really helps. And we use laser for like skin problems. Sometimes if you have a lit grant there, that was one of the questions too, is about a lit granuloma, which is where a dog will start to lick and then they'll form this big um, sore, deep sore on themselves. And they'll just keep licking because it's, it's a, uh, they're trying to soothe it, but it's a, it's a deep, painful and irritating spot. And uh, there's varying, reasons why it starts but you can i've had good luck with laser laser therapy and other therapy even massaging around around that to get the blood flow in there it really helps um but you have to keep the dog away from it <laughs> too which okay. is the hardest thing yeah. <laughs> until it's healed yeah nat from chile she said which is uh i think this is the one you were thinking of there's a few questions in here any tips on joint pain and arthritis and for an anxious dog that keeps licking a wound on his leg and formed a granuloma, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, putting the cone of shame on just breaks my heart and makes him feel miserable. One month has been torture. You know, we did get, um, we have two rescue dogs at our old office, those big pit bulls, and um, they make these like little, they're almost like little spa treatment blow up. You've seen them, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Like, you don't have to do the cone of shame right, anymore. Right, right. Just blow up that little, it's almost yeah. like those, um, those things people carry on airplanes to fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah. The neck <laughs> pillow. Yeah. Yeah. And that works. That, that actually works good. Especially it depends though. If you have a good contortionist who knows how to push the pillow out of the way, especially on a front leg, it's kind of hard. Uh, so sometimes you have to, you have to be innovative and put something else in there. Um, so they also have just the, the buster collar. So it doesn't come out over the good? side, but it's just in the, on the neck and, uh, um, and also sometimes bandaging helps, uh, but a lot of times these wounds need the air to get to it too. Right. So, um, but, uh, sometimes, uh, I, I rarely use antibiotics on them anymore. I used to use that. That's what you were supposed to do in Western medicine is use antibiotics for long term because a lot of times they have a deep infection, but if you use a laser on them, that's that kills the, the um, bacteria on there and helps heal the infection. So, so it works really good for that or any wounds that they have. Um, and anxiety can be a trigger for them continuing to lick this. So yeah. if they're anxious, say about you going to work or they have separation anxiety, then that all needs to be dealt with too. So that's one thing about going to people's homes. You can kind of see holistically what their environment is and can kind of see things that the owner doesn't necessarily see that's happening. Mm, um, and that gives them some insight on things they need to, to work on too. Anxiety would be a good one would be flower essences. Yes, it would. That would be <laughs> very good. That and uh, essential oils, uh, 
and all that stuff. A lot of it and, and massage, you know, massaging your dog, doing all that um, head massage to try to do calming points, um, which is where we kind of naturally pet our, our animals and like cats really like their heads rubbed, but dogs do too. And a lot of those are calming points. If, if you look at the acupuncture chart on their, on their head and behind their ears and on their cheeks and stuff, a lot of those are calming points. So, so keep doing that and that'll help. That's so interesting. Shanti Deva in her house, she's a 10 year old. She, she was saying the other day, she was like grabbing the points around the like the sides of their faces. And she was saying, these are the calming points. She has a, her teacher brings dogs to school. I was wondering where she got that from. Yeah. <clears throat> it sounds like it works. Um, and then the last part of this question from Nat was any tips on joint pain or arthritis? That's a big one. That is a big one. That's probably most of the patients I see for acupuncture are for that because we have a lot of older patients now. Thank goodness. Um, and, uh, uh, the, the biggest thing, uh, diet can help with that too. Cause some of, sometimes you can use spices in their food like turmeric like, uh-huh, and ginger, things like that. If they're, if they're cold, like this time of year in the, in the winter time, a lot of times they're, they're cold over their back and stuff. And so they need, they need, um, warming things to help them move. And a lot of dogs get really stiff when they sleep, just like we do. I'm finding as I get older, <laughs> I'm getting more stiff and then you kind of warm out of it as, as you move. And that's another big one is exercise. Um, I'm amazed at how many people don't walk their dogs and they really need to be walked every day. They should have a walk. So, um, so just continue to do that. Cause if you, you know, if you don't move, you're going to lose it. Right. Just like with us. So they really, even, even the old ones, even the ones that can barely move, even if you can get a couple houses down on the street, it's good for their brain. They're smelling stuff. They're getting fresh air. And so so that's really important to have them move. Um, But also you massaging them. There's a lot of alternative therapies you can do herbs depending on what their constitution is um cbd oil is a big thing nowadays and that does seem to help some patients it's not a panacea you know not all of them respond to that but a lot of them do and especially in conjunction with other things what about uh like glucosamine chondritin msm that kind of thing has that have you seen that to be at all helpful yeah and some patients not again not not all of them respond but uh again i have a i have an older kitty patient who um, was really came up really lame. Like she couldn't even wear bear weight on her front leg. And um, so we did some stuff and nothing was really working. And finally x-rayed her and she had, um, she had a um, tendon and ligament problem. So I ended up uh, using Desiquin, which is a supplement. We used CBD oil on her and that really helped. Nothing hmm. else was really working for her, but that helped. And she's not a kitty who would respond to massage therapy for me. She doesn't appreciative <laughs> of my visit. <laughs> she's a little cranky sometimes. But she's uh, uh, she's more bark than bite. But um, but so yeah, there's there's a lot you can do. And and again, laser. You know, I've had cats that respond to laser therapy hmm. that pain. Um, and uh, oh, Essential oils help a lot too because you can rub those into the spot that's really warm. That helps, and uh, so I, I'm not afraid to use actual pain medication though either. Um, so a lot of times I combine things, and uh, but that being said, a lot of times we can decrease the dose of the Western pain meds mm. um, by using some of these alternative things. So it doesn't so. just totally dope them out. Yeah, and they don't. It doesn't trash their liver, or kidneys, mm-hmm. or whatever. Right. Yeah. I remember last time you came, you gave us some essential oils for Gracie. And because my question was like, how does it get through their fur? But you were saying it actually, you rub it on their fur, it actually gold. And I did all this research because I'd wake up in the middle of the night and hear Joy teetering. And she was, and I'd feel her ears and they were like, ice cold. cold. And so I ended up getting like a little heating bag. And then I got a those old school water bottle and they'll like snuggle up next to it. Um, 
it's just been, it's been interesting. It's like every time sunrise is new with your pet, it's like a whole new series yep. of it is. investigation. It, it is. It really is. I, I, I mean, I have to say I learned something from every patient, I think, because um, not everyone responds the same way. And it's interesting how not, not all of them respond the way I think that they, they should, <laughs> you know, how I have in my brain, that I think, <laughs> this is how this should work in you. And then they're like, no, that's not going to work in my body. So, you know, some animals respond better to homeopathic remedies, respond better to herbal therapies, some, you know, flower essences. Like I've had a few that they didn't respond to anything, but they responded to flower essence. Well, so, yeah. I mean, I think about, I think back to like when I started putting joy on so that self heal flower yeah. essence and just regularly every meal, every, every, every water bowl, every, and her blood platelet issues really stabilized after yeah. that point. Yeah. She didn't have any more strokes and yeah. was like, duh, right? Yeah. Like, I remember you saying that. I'm like, <laughs> well, like what's different with her? Why is she so stable? And then you said that I was like, oh, yeah, she likes that. Crazy. Yeah. Um, I was going to insert my own question in here and that is what led you from being a, like a regular veterinarian for so long and what got you curious about diving into the more holistic stuff? Like did something happen or did you just get yes. interested? Well, I, I've all, I've kind of been interested in a uh, kid. So I knew I, you know, I'd always, I always knew that I kind of wanted to learn it and I just kept putting it off, putting it off. And then, um, my own dog at the time, he's a, he's a golden mix. He, he was sickly from a pup and I, you know, I didn't know anything about it, but, um, so yeah, I started learning with him cause I wanted to, and that's when I, that's when I really wanted to, to learn some other. And plus I was, I kept getting into dead ends with Western medicine. I'd have all these cases and, you know, I'd, I'd consult with an internist and I said, well, you know, keep hitting the wall. Like there's nothing else. Like, oh, it's like, God. That's, like the, that's the last thing you want to tell that's someone. Not, that's not the way I, I'm like, there's got to be a bunch of other stuff I could be doing, you know, to help these guys. So, and that's when um, I had heard of Dr. Shady Institute. And, okay. Actually, we actually covered this. Does CBD work on dogs and are there any foods or supplements that can alleviate anxiety or aggression in my dog? Anything you want to add to what you've already said? Um, the aggression that, that can be a difficult one. Um, and, uh, a lot of times you need the help of a good trainer, um, and behaviorist. Uh, unfortunately there's not a lot of veterinary behaviorists around. Like we only have one in this state. Um, aggression can quickly escalate and, you know, depending on what, what's triggering the aggression. Um, and some dogs are just wired differently. And so it's, uh, and it, you know, it's, it can be a dangerous situation. Um, especially if it's directed towards people or people in the house. Um, you know, there's certainly, uh, I've certainly seen some pretty bad situations. I can't say I've had some really good luck with, um, like inter, to inter aggression with my own dogs. Mm -hmm. Um, like they're jealous or Gracie was a little troublemaker a few years ago and it was like biting joy. And, uh -huh. um, so we started putting infinite love in her food and misting her and it helped a lot. Oh, good. Just okay. like softened her yeah. energy. So you might want to try flower essences yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. We've got a question from Myrna in Croatia. Is there an alternative to treating dogs IBD, an alternative to corti corticosteroids? corticosteroids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends. Uh, it depends how advanced the disease is. Um, but a lot of times, yeah, if you uh, a, lot, a lot of herbs can help with that. Um, and uh, I had that was the other reason for doing all this other stuff because all three of my pets had GI issues. Oh, wow. Um, and so that was a one of my first things at food, food might be playing a big part of this because wow. I was on the, you know, kibble bandwagon for a long time too. And, uh, so, uh, I think that yes, definitely we can help with that. Uh, acupuncture can help a lot with that internal medicine cases too, and herb herbal therapies. Um, but yeah, definitely, uh, some animals still need steroids because it's advanced enough that their, you know, immune system has just overtaken their GI tract. But again, there's a lot of things you can do to, to try to get them off the steroids or not need to go on them in the first place. 
And do you recommend like bone broths for that type of situation? Or? Yeah, depending on what they're sensitive to. Um, again, it's triggered by allergies. So a lot of cats who have, if they're diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease, they can progress to intestinal lymphoma. So anything that has inflammation has a potential to create a lot of change. And so you want to try to decrease that inflammation. I mean, some inflammation is good. If you have a fever, you know, you right. want to get rid of that. But um, inflammation like that or arthritis, you need to try to get it to calm down. Hmm. Let's see. Um, interested in gut health for older dogs is the next question. So when animals age, just like we do, they're kind of like, uh, kind of like babies in that their intestinal systems are very sensitive and uh, they can't digest things like they did when they were younger. So they definitely need a lot of, um, a lot of softer foods, cooked foods are usually better for older dogs. Um, and, uh, kind of gentle things for, for them. And, uh, that helps to kind of keep them even. And a lot of, a lot of dogs need, uh, and cats need probiotics, mm -hmm. digestive enzymes, things like that. And there's them. like easy formulas you can find online yeah, that have there's, there's, both mixed together. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. just toss a spoonful in the food. Yep. Mm -hmm. Anything you recommend or just, uh, there, well, there's, there's quite a few out there so that I brands. think that are good. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I'll just leave it. <laughs> okay. Um, we have another question here. Seems like this is a really common issue. Any recommendations for treating chronic IBD in cats? See, these are all food issues, yeah. right? It yeah, sounds like mostly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what, what will happen a lot of times is, you, you know, they'll get a recommendation to, uh, to treat with a prescription diet or something like that that's low allergen or has no, no allergens in it, but right. you can do that with a home cooked diet too, where you just kind of, you just kind of do a cleanse in their system basically, and then gradually kind of introduce other foods and see what they're, what they're reactive to. There's also a, a for food sensitivity, you can do a test, you can order it from um, a team up pets, I think, uh, Dr. Dodd's website. She's got a NutriScan that you can do at home. You can order the kit. It's kind of expensive, but it does give you information and it just works on a saliva. So it works on a immunoglobulin test rather. It's not, so it's not a true allergy test like you would take your dog to the dermatologist for, but um, it does give you some good insight as to what might be triggering some of these GI issues. And, um, and skin issues too can be related to stuff their, their gut's reacting to. So less skin allergies can be from that. Hmm. Kind of like people, the gut, flora, skin combination. Right. Wow. They have all the same issues. Yeah. They do. <laughs> I guess because they're eating similar foods. Mm -hmm. um, Wendy from Santa Fe says um, she also would like tips on doggy anxiety. She has an older big dog who gets super anxious on walks when he's around other dogs and when people come to the house. He's a rescue dog with a pretty traumatic story. And she said she's implemented some awesome ways to work with this behaviorally and help him put his focus on me, safety, positive results. But any suggestions you might have for nervous system support? Um, yes. Well, as Katie said before, um, the fluorescences <laughs> I think would be excellent. Um, and if your dog, you know, if they don't like the spray on them, you can always spray it on your hands and then rub it on them or put it on, you know, like a little collar thing or something. So they're getting, they're getting that around. And so I would use something like that, that are the essential oils, you know, before you go for a walk and cause walking, yeah, you should be doing, and even though it's a challenge, um, but, uh, yeah, those kind of things, uh, CBD oil sometimes can be very helpful too, and just kind of evening them out. So they're not so reactive. Um, but just continually working with the dog, that's the big thing is because it's going to be a lifelong, you know, work to, to, to do that. I know because of my monster dog <laughs> doing that every day training on walks and stuff. So, and I think the hardest part is trying to uh, figure out your, your reactions to the dog. Cause I, you know, I found that out with myself and like, you know, 
you'll, you'll see that the dog is doing well and then all of a sudden something will shift and then you'll realize, oh, it's something, something I'm doing. I'm inadvertently rewarding this behavior without realizing it. So really sometimes if they're, if they're really, if you know that they know how to do something and then all of a sudden they're not doing it or they're acting out or something, then you have to kind of take a step back and kind of look and see, well, what changed? You know, I must have changed. And a lot of times you'll find that it's something in yourself <laughs> that, that you've changed. Um, and uh, so, no, yeah. not us. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, let's see. Steffi in West Virginia asks or says, my dog hates being groomed. And hates getting baths. Oh, it's like my little Ichi who hates getting her nails clipped. Yeah. We've tried CBD oil, doggy stress treats, um, doing those things more often. So he gets used to it. Nothing seems to work, she says. Any tips or advice on how to get him to cooperate for grooming and baths? He's a rescue with PTSD and anxiety from an attack with too much bigger dogs. Oh, poor baby. Okay. So I guess it dep- I'm not sure if a I guess it's kind of hard to answer this because I don't know the whole story, but um, I would say if they're having trouble at the groomers per se, like if you're having to take him into a grooming salon and he's freaking out in that situation, you might have to look for a mobile groomer perhaps that comes to the house. And uh, we, uh, I know there's some that will actually come into the house rather than doing it out in their van. Not, Not all of them will do that, but some will. And uh, I think the hardest part is just doing it, just doing it gradually and and trying to be uh, positive with the dog because each time they have a reinforcing bad experience, it's just going to build on itself. So if you can just kind of do it, and I don't know if it's, if it's her doing it herself that is, you know, going crazy, but it sounds like taking him to the grooming salon. I'm not sure. It's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to tell. But, um, but even at home, like a lot of dogs hate their toenails done, like, um, like Ichi. Uh, so a Dremel tool really, if they're, if, if you can get them trained to be not scared of the sound, that's, that's kind of the first step. Um, it's but, like a file. You basically yeah. File yeah. It down. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's like the motorized, you can get one of those little craft Dremel tools and then, cause then they don't spin too hard, but not, don't get the industrial, you know men's garage <laughs> tool that's gonna be too powerful but i think i think mine's like the 7700 or something and uh, i use the low setting only and there's a grinding wheel that you can use and um it just grinds the nail so it makes a little vibration but it's different than when, when you're actually trimming the nail you're actually kind of pinching the nail a little bit so dogs really don't like that and if they've ever been quick they have a, that hurts yeah. and yeah. they have a long memory for <laughs> that. So, and some dogs may just associate if they've had a bad experience with a toenail term, the whole grooming experience is mm-hmm. going to be horrible. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, and some dogs mm-hmm. actually need anti-anxiety medication until you can get their behavior modified. So, I mean, that's sometimes some of them really need to be on mm. medication for a little bit. I know Gracie, she doesn't like her nails cut and we've just, we resorted to giving her a, a cracker every yep. single <laughs> nail just constantly and she and she was okay. fine yeah. Then each, yeah we needed to put the muzzle yeah on yeah jenny in wisconsin who has a red healer rescue dog asks is there a remedy you recommend for a bad breath she's got a senior dog who's 13 that has some missing or worn teeth and she does get her teeth cleaned by the vet but she asks what remedies can she use at home between vet cleanings? She's tried brushing her teeth, but it doesn't seem to do the trick. CET chews work well, but she has some difficulty chewing because of the missing teeth. Okay. So I guess the the main thing is to figure out if the, the odor is actually coming from her teeth or it's actually coming from her gut. So a lot of these male odors are actually coming from their stomach. So, um, so that's one thing to have your vet try to figure out if it's actually coming from the digestive system below the teeth. Um, And how would you figure that out? So basically, well, you can tell, I mean, if they, if they don't have any obvious dental disease going on, you know, then we have to look at the gut. And, uh, and also you can tell by if the, I know it's kind of graphic, but (laughs) if the poop's really smelly (laughs) um, as opposed to, you know, just smelling like a normal poop, you know, some of them are really, really bad smelling and that's a lot of dampness in there and so they're inflamed 
in there. And so that's one way you can tell. So you, you kind of need a holistic vet probably to try to discern that because a Western vet will be like, what the heck is damp? I don't know what that means. So, um, so you need a holistic vet to help you with that. But as far as things to do in the mouth, um, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. You can do uh, coconut oil is a good antibiotic and uh, live dogs love that so you can use that as like a kind of a toothpaste um, and get that to swirl around I know people kind of swirl their mouth around if they have an infection and that does help with that and uh, again on the essential oils yeah. there's a um, Dr. Shelton has a dog breath one and uh, she's also now has a light one so the ones who don't like the full strength dog breath which sensitive dogs don't like that it's a little bit more dilute sample but you can put that in the coconut oil and rub that on the teeth brushing is good if you can do it um, because that any kind of mechanical action on the outside of the teeth will help um so we use colloidal silver too yes colloidal, colloidal silver, silver mm-hmm. coconut essential yep. oils mm-hmm. yep worked really well yeah but if you can keep if you can if you can get your dog to really chew on things when they're younger and they keep that going i mean some dogs just aren't chewers they just don't like to chew as much but um and you can keep a lot of dogs will keep chewing you know into their senior years and that really helps so um you know, bones, that's another, I guess that's another topic to talk about is raw bones. And uh, I think they are good for the teeth, especially if you get them chewing on them when they're young. Um, but if you don't want to start an older dog on raw bones, because they'll break their teeth, they're, they're just not they're just not strong enough to handle that. And then a lot of people leave the bones for the dogs to chew on all the time. And they shouldn't do that. I would say to just do it a couple times a week for you know, 10 to 15 minutes and then take the bone away. So less likely to break the teeth, but chewing is a big part of keeping their teeth clean. And then I know, um, I don't know in other States, if this happens, but we have a couple of places around the Valley where we can do non anesthesia teeth cleaning, mm-hmm. uh, which has just been amazing. Right. Because some yep. of these elderly dogs, right. Either you just don't want to put them under, or mm-hmm. it's just a huge trauma that we don't need right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so that's for like grade one dental so when they don't have a whole lot of when they don't have any periodontal disease then yeah that's a good way to go if they have too much disease then it's not good because it'll be too painful for them and you can't get a good cleaning because you can't get up under there and get all the junk out from underneath the gums but um and a lot of people a lot of Vets really disagree with any part of the non-anesthetic cleaning, but I, I think it's really helped a lot of dogs, especially for younger ones that just have a little bit of tartar. They get that, and the ones that we refer to do do the ultrasonic you know, scaling and they polish and all that stuff. So the groomers who do tooth cleaning, if they're hand scaling with a metal scaler, they can be doing damage if they're not polishing the teeth, which much of them, most of them don't. So that's where you have to be careful. If the groomer's brushing their teeth, great, you know, mm-hmm. have them do that. But you know, be leery of the scaling of the teeth, which some of them do, because you can etch the enamel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I met one once who could just like put the back, put the dog. She sits on the floor mm-hmm. and she put the dog on her back and just sort of straddle the dog in between her legs yeah and then the dog would just relax yeah she'd work on the teeth Mm -hmm. yep amazing i know she's really good um what else about teeth oh one thing gosh i wish there was one time where somebody told me or maybe it was at the vet last time long time ago when joy got her teeth pulled it's like when in doubt just pull it right because as they get older you're no longer able to pull it and then you fall into the problem of the rotting teeth there's nothing you can do yeah so like if you if you have sort of something on the edge, you would just take it out, right? Yeah. I mean, if there's any, if there's any, yeah, disease going on, especially if you're, if you're already in there doing a dental, yeah. Yeah. The best thing is just to get it out. Yeah. And it's amazing how much they can eat with less teeth. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. They can. It's not really an issue. Yeah, it's not. A lot of people think it is, but it's not. A lot of them swallow their food whole anyway. And uh, cats especially, I mean, they, yeah. They'd be fine. (laughs) Cindy Hervey asks, um, please ask about treating lipomas. I've been feeding milk thistle seed to my border collie lab, um, who's seven and a half people years, and he's had nine bumps pop up in just the last six months. 
a couple as big as 50, oh, 50 cent pieces. Wow. Okay. So, um, lipomas are, um, that's usually a sign of damp or phlegm. And usually they come up because we're feeding, you know, we're feeding a damp inducing diet. Once they have them, it's really difficult to, to that, get rid of them. They're the like fatty, a soft the, tumor. Yeah. It's a fatty growth. Um, and as, as we get, as they get older, they tend to form the, you know, when they're young, the fat's kind of laid flat underneath the muscles. And um, when they get older, they tend to form more into nodules and um, because the cells change and that kind of thing, but they're still fatty growths. But I have, I have a patient like that too, who, um, but a, a lot of times you can tell like this patient of mine, her lumps were all forming on certain meridians. Oh, wow. And so we were treating, so hers were all on our liver gallbladder meridian. So I'm like, are you a mad dog? <laughs> Even though she mad. was, that's what I was thinking. She <laughs> angry. had angry, you know, she had some, some issues that she was keeping inside and they were all popping out on her. Resentments. So, yeah. So she, so I put her on a combination of herbs and so hers, they didn't, they, they're not going away, but she's not getting new ones. And so that would be your goal is to find, um, find a holistic vet to help you with this because you can't, I don't recommend taking them all off because then you have more just pop up. Um, and I, I actually made that mistake with my, with my other dog is that he was a lipoma dog. Um, and I took a lot off and then he healed from that and then more just popped up and it was just, you know, it's something that I put him through that I didn't need to. Cause so. you're a surgeon and mm -hmm. you can remove them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So more pop up. And when you talk about, um, one of the methods, that we can take into our own hands as reducing damp in their diet. That would mean minimizing dry food. Yep. And yeah, pretty much taking them off dry food if you, if possible and do home cooked like mostly. rice, veggies, meat. Yep. Vitamin. Yeah. And there's um damp drainer ingredients, you know, you can put in there too, that, that would help. Um, like, like, uh, like seaweed is one of those things. And, um, uh, so a lot of green veggies, um, I think turnips even, you know, you have to use those sparingly, but cause <laughs> they don't like the taste, but, but you can cut up little bits and it, you can hide it in the rest of the stuff, but mostly in, in, in a, like a, um, kind of like a lower carb kind of diet, less rice and yeah yeah more, more protein veg. and and veggies yeah mm -hmm. and are eggs good for all dogs raw Egg, cooked uh raw cooked. usually hard boiled or soft boiled are the best for for dogs what do you think of raw eggs i see a lot of people just i know raw I, eggs. I i worry about them getting like salmonella and stuff although if they're got if everything else is healthy they should be able to handle a raw egg without any issues and if you i mean if you have chickens yourself and have eggs and yeah, you know, what's going into the chicken. So I would say, yeah, by all means, go ahead and do that. And I don't recommend it every day, you know, maybe once or twice a week. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, eggs are good. Eggs are a good cheese source and, um, yeah. Okay. We have one last question. Um, uh, do you have any holistic approach to heartworm prevention? The short answer is no, <laughs> nothing really holistically will kill the heartworms. Uh, so they have a life cycle. So heartworm has been found in all 50 states and uh, it's transmitted by mosquitoes. So definitely, you know, areas in the South and, you know, the Eastern seaboard and Midwest, uh, but basically it, it's everywhere. Um, and uh, the, larvae it takes about six months for them to reach adult worm size where they go to the heart but in the meantime they're circulating in the blood and so um once they turn into adult there's really nothing to get rid of them other than than actually medication to to kill them mm -hmm. yeah so the heart what about like uh recovery. So like you take that heavy medication and then is there something you can do to sort of nourish the yeah, body? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's lots of things you can do to support them through the process. Um, and so if they have to have heartworm treatment, if they have to have the injections and things to treat, then yeah, there's a lot of things because the, the medication to get rid of heartworm is arsenic based. Oh my so, God, are yeah. you serious? Yeah. Yeah. So you're basically so, giving injections yeah, to arsenic? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, Holy um, moly. So it's, um, but you know, if you, if, if you find 
that the like cats if cats cats can get heartworm disease too and they only need one or two adult worms that actually you know cause a lot of heart disease so um so in those states yeah you really have to do some preventive here um i it, it depends where they're located as far as what i recommend for heartworm prevention so um, and it depends on their lifestyle. Like if they're traveling all over, then they need to be on it. Um, otherwise, uh, I just, it depends. Ooh, this might be kind of a touchy subject. What, what's your take on vaccines? Oh, vaccine? No, I, that's fine. I, I, I'm happy to talk about that. I, I haven't had my dogs have vaccines in yeah. years and years and years. No, I think uh, if they get their initial puppy and kitten vaccines, right. Um, then I think that's important though. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people who are getting puppies and that breeders are actually saying, no, just do the titers, you know, only give a couple of vaccines, but there's a point when their maternal antibodies are interfering with the vaccines. That's why we give the series as, as babies. So they need to go through that to make sure they have immunity. After that, though, um, then then we can do the titers, blood titers, where you draw blood, and I usually send it to Kansas State, where they do the um, uh, they do the rabies export titers. So if we're shipping a dog to another country or even to Hawaii, um, they need to have those anyway. And so that that's why I send them there, and they're not very expensive to send out there. Oh, so instead of getting a rabies vaccine, you just yeah. prove that the dog doesn't have rabies. Yeah. Well, you you prove that they have a protective antibody. However, many states do not recognize the titers as proof of protection from rabies. So, um, so they won't license the dogs. So like here, um, Maricopa County does not. However, um, I have some people like in Fountain Hills, they, they do, well, they will give a license if you have proof of a positive titer. So I think it depends where you are. I think there's, I don't know how many states now, there might be eight states now that recognize mm -hmm. Um, titers. So I'm hoping that as more people do the titers, they can, but um, they're also now, they're trying to do studies with the distemper hepatitis parvo vaccine to show that it's not just three years, but it's five to seven year immunity on those vaccines. And any dog who's sick should not have a vaccine no matter what. And I see that all the time that they go in for something they're sick and they still get vaccinated because oh. they haven't had them and then they oh just my get god the normal vet that yeah. i used to go to is just like um, adamant it was like every one one or two years yeah. every single yeah. time i brought the dog and it was like oh we need to do the yeah vaccines and i yeah. wiggle out of it somehow yeah, yeah. And it's just not, it's not, it's not good for them. So I titer a lot. I do a lot of that. And the older ones or ones that are sick or whatever that I think should not have the vaccine, I'll, I'll write a letter, you know, you know, there, you know, and you know what drew me to that conclusion was um, one time I brought two of my dogs and got their rabies vaccine. And like very soon after they both had incontinence issues that we could tie to them. Have you seen that before? In the past, or I haven't other not examples? that particularly, but I've seen plenty of other plenty of other reactions. Side uh -huh, yeah, including like what Joy had the immune mediated thrombocytopenia. I I had two. I have two patients now that uh, that have had that. Like, and can link it to a vaccination. Like, you know what? That's interesting because I feel like when I shared the story of Joy, I had a lot of people writing in and saying, "Oh, my dog has the same thing," or "My dog had," or "I wish I would have known this." My dog had the same thing, and she you know, had internal bleeding and we brought her to the vet and she died there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you're, what you're saying is there's a possibility it's connected to vaccines? Well, I think anything that, that stimulates the immune system can, can lead to some kind of autoimmune disease and the vaccines, that's what they're designed to do is to stimulate an immune response. And so if we over vaccinate, like we're giving too many then their body is just constantly in a state of inflammation with these and you know it's like anything else that you become sensitive to it's usually because you've had exposure you know repeated exposure to something and then your body becomes sensitized to something in it so um so yeah i mean i've seen a lot more reactions as i've got you know when i first started we didn't see hardly any vaccine reactions and now i see them very commonly um wow yeah what are what are um what are some of the um you know, the most common things that you're seeing in, in your practice today? 
Like maybe the top three things that you just pretty much see over and over and over. Uh, as far as vaccines or just in general? Just in general, like people call with complaints for, I mean, we, oh, we see some, like skin. <laughs> we see, we saw skin anxiety and IBD. As yeah. Like recurring. And those are all inflammatory. Those are all inflammatory problems. And I think it's all, it all stems from everything. You know, we're just bombarded all the time with all kinds of, of things that are not good for us, you know, in our homes, you know, we're just kind of bombarded with all those things and foods we eat, you know, it's like, you try to try to, get as good a food for your dog as you can, as you do you, you know, try to get, or if you can grow your own, even, even better, but most of us can't, you know, especially in a city or something and we don't have time, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, people in cities who have market, you know, like there's farmer's markets or they have a community garden or something or a co-op that you can go get, you know, food like that for your pet. Um, um, and yourself. <laughs> and yourself. So, yeah. But yeah. I'd say inflammatory things are probably the primary things I see, see patients for. Wow. Yeah. And it's safe to say you can add herbs and spices for the most part, as long as they'll enjoy the taste, like mm. the, like the, like the turmeric and right. ginger and the, mm-hmm. that's so nice. Yeah. We can give to the pets what we give to ourselves. Uh, any last words of wisdom before we wrap up that you would have any sort of last um, tips for pet owners or in terms of holistic approaches or just words of wisdom in general? Yeah, I guess um, one of the biggest things um, that I see, I think the most successful treatment outcomes I have are because the owners are so involved and so willing to, to help the animals. And uh, I think it's because uh, you know, if, if we're stressed out, the animals pick that up. So um, just be mindful when you're around your pet, especially if they're sick, that you be in a positive state of mind when you're, when you're with them, like, because they are so emotional. They pick up all of our emotions too. And so they internalize a lot of that stuff. So if, especially if your animal's sick to try to try to be positive and, you know, just, uh, be loving with them like, like you are normally, but even more so just be conscious in your own mind of what you're bringing to them, what kind of energy you're bringing to them. Cause that plays an enormous part in um, their, their treatment outcomes, I think, because I have another dog. I have to mention her because she is probably my first miracle dog. <laughs> She's like joy who's gone on for like three years almost. But she, when I first saw her, she was so inflamed. All, she, they'd taken her to like three or four other vets and no one could figure out what's going on with her. And I saw her and once and I was like, oh my gosh, she was having so many problems. And then the next time I saw her, she was actually in a coma and I thought she was no. going to pass away. Oh. And so the, so I did acupuncture on her to try to help, you know, get the inflammation down and, uh, and we were treating her with herbs and stuff. And, but I think it was the owner who really, who pulled that dog through. And she basically said that she gave her, (laughs) she told her that, okay, you need to either come out of this, you know, in the next few days, or you need to, it's okay for you to go, you know, and that dog decided that she wanted to and so the next day she woke up <laughs> and uh, the owner has just been so committed and so, so positive in her, in her treatment that I think that I think a lot of people just, they don't realize how stressed out they are and how they, how, how, they can how that con- transmits and how they can contribute in a positive way to help yeah. heal their own. Yeah. Pets. yeah. Oh, one last thing before we go. Yeah. Um, I think I asked you before, but if you see a correlation between or if you ever hear a correlation between the typical ailments that a pet has and the owner has, you know how people say people start to oh, look like their pets yes. or pets look like their people. And I had that sort of weird moment when, the, um, when I went to, you know, see Chinese medicine doctors and they were like, you have no blood, your blood is so low. You need to build your blood and build your blood. And then I'm looking at joy going, wait a minute, <laughs> 
<laughs> we have the same issue. What's going on here? It is. It's, it's, it <laughs> is interesting for me. Are we sharing? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. I see that actually pretty commonly, um, like a lot of metabolic things. Um, so, uh, yeah. I'll, uh, and sometimes I don't realize it. And, and sometimes now I, now I start to ask, you know, I, not that I want to delve into people's personal things, but, <laughs> but sometimes people will volunteer that like a lot of a lot of animals that have intestinal problems that people do too, um, but a lot of thyroid issues. I'm finding that a lot of the animals have the thyroid issues. So, so I don't, I, I don't have an explanation for that other than it is a very common, uh, common experience. I can't, I can't exactly say my monster dog is, has this, you know, I wish he would, he would take in some of my calm energy. My cats do. I do yoga every day and my cats are all like, yeah, we'll do yoga with you. And my dog's like, can you, can you stop now and play? So, um, but yeah, it is, it is interesting how that happens. And I, I, don't, I think it's just, I think it just shows that, um, you know, there's so much we don't know with, with animals and pets. And it's funny how they're doing all these studies now. Like I always think that they come out and say, oh yeah, dogs can, you know, they know, and they have, you know, certain vocabulary or intelligence, but, um, and all anybody who's a dog owner knows already that those are all true, (laughs) you know, but they have to have scientific proof. So, yeah. (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) <laughs> that's so interesting you know, I used to th- I used to I used to actually tell people that in flower essence trainings about pets like if your if your pet has um you know looks sad or something then also you take the sad flower essences even if you don't feel sad just sort of transmit that through your own body uh-huh. But it starts to get strange when it's on the physical realm. It, it does. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, so it's just sympathetic, mm-hmm. empathetic, uh, something going on. I, there. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Wow. Well, thank you so much for being with oh, us. Thank you for having me. Hugely valuable. I'm sure all the listeners will, will agree. We'll put all the resources, everything you mentioned about the books to the websites, to the Dremel tools and any other flower essence recommendations and things we can come up with. We'll put that all on the blog post. If so, I know um, if people are in the Phoenix Valley, is there any way they can see you? Is there any information that you'd want to share? Um, yeah, they can contact me. Um, we have, uh, they can call me <laughs> um, and I have a website too that, and we can put that on there as well. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of limited and, my range and we do valley. house calls right yeah so you've got a certain yeah yeah especially now that we're so busy because we're booking out a few Way weeks out. ahead so yeah. um but yeah I'm, I'm and if you um would you ever be interested in bringing on any apprentices if there were apprentices around the states who are like this is or in the phoenix valley who you know since you are getting so busy and people are mo- i mean i just from my personal opinion, I just see the demand for this mm-hmm. growing. Like this yeah. is not going to be. <laughs> no. stays There's there. actually quite a few of us out there now, um, and uh, not all of us do mobile, but uh, some of us do. Uh, but there's definitely a lot, lot more holistic pets out. And as far as me taking on someone, I don't know. I've, I've, I've thought about it, but then it's hard to, you know, because you don't always practice the same way and, right. and that kind of thing. So. Um, yeah. I, the best way is just to go maybe like to the Chi Institute and start learning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And a lot of, that's a good thing that the good thing now is that a lot of vet schools are incorporating alternative medicine tracks to actually expose people wow. to that. Impressive. Um, and uh, Florida actually has, you know, they have a whole, they have a whole section on alternative therapy and you can take that along with your that curriculum. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely out there and there's, um, you know, a lot of the specialists too are actually incorporating, uh, acupuncture, especially into their, like, we have a integrative oncologist here and there's, there's several others in the country that do um, Chinese medicine along with their Western oncology wow. treatments. So That's it's so really, fabulous. it's really interesting. So yeah. Wonderful. 
weaving the east into the west yeah that's so great thank you so much for being with us such a pleasure thank you so much for listening to the flower lounge i'm katie hess and we'll be releasing a new podcast every wednesday if you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation share it with them and don't forget to subscribe to find out what your favorite flowers mean about you take the quiz at lotusway.com 